service this morning. Now, I felt it extremely important to start off by telling you something that is crucial in your walk with the Lord. You know, you've been hearing pastor talk about last week, we talked about depression. He mentioned this week, we would talk about anxiety and he's been mentioning this for some weeks now. And we thought it to be the best thing that we could hit right after Easter, right after the resurrection service. And we wanted to give you the keys to overcome these areas of your life because it's crucial as a Christian that you walk and live free. Amen? Amen. But I wanted to bring our attention to something before we hop too deep into that. And that's this fact right here, that we're in a war. No, no, we're in a war. I don't know if you know anything about war, but there's some things that become irrelevant when you enter into a war. There's some things that used to be highly important in society that become far irrelevant when you enter into a war. See, when your livelihood is threatened, when your life is threatened, when your home is threatened, you become a different person. Now, I know some nice people here, Terry Keegan, head deacon Terry Keegan, one of the nicest people ever meet, coolest people ever meet. But I'll tell you something. If you threatened his family, you would probably see a side of Terry that you never want to see. And he would turn into a loving man of God, into a protector real quick. And that goes same for Pastor Kayla as well. And I tell you that because when you understand there's a threat, you move differently. This morning, I want us to understand that we have to move differently in this season right now. As Christians, we have to understand that we don't need to move in fear, but we need to operate in a place where we are very aware of what is occurring around us and through us and in us and what's being fed to us. Because we can easily get to a place where we walk around like sheep herded by an evil shepherd. And that's why Jesus said, the sheep will know my voice from the voice of the stranger. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church, and I love this because he said, listen, we are not ignorant, and therefore we're not taken advantage of. This morning I need you to know, we're going to gain a knowledge. That's why the word says my people perish for a lack of knowledge. We're going to gain a knowledge of the schemes of the devil. But I need you to understand that sometimes we start throwing this word devil out from the pulpit and you get goosebumps in your chair. I can't believe he's talking about the devil like that. He don't know. You know, God great, God's greatest generals have the greatest uh, target on their back. Let me tell you something about the devil's power. Number one, it was defeated on the third day when Jesus rolled from the grave. God's not waiting for it to happen. He's waiting for us to catch up to it. Number two, the devil has what we call assumed power. That means it's only what we assume he has is what he really has. I want you to think about that big bad bully on the block. Because what happens is, is they might have the tattoos, they might have the stature, but all it takes is one five foot two kid from Elmira who's really been about it and grew up in New York City. And he's really in the streets like that. And he walks up to that big bully and he punches him right in his face. And then all of a sudden people realize you weren't really as scary as you thought. We just... We just gave you so much power in our head, not based on what you've done alone, but based on who we thought you were. I'm telling you this morning that we've had a misconception on who the enemy is. We've thought in our minds that he's more powerful than he is. But I need to let you know, and it goes with the title of today's sermon, and I need you to write this down. You need to have your mind on your business. Your mind on your business. I don't need you to have your mind on your neighbor's business. I don't need you to have your, do you to be a busybody caring about what everyone's go through. I don't need your mind on the devil's business. The Bible says that if we're Jesus's, our father is the God in heaven, Jesus Christ, Yahweh. Our father's not the devil. We don't need to know what he's got for our lives. We need our mind on the business that Jesus Christ talked about when he was a young boy. And Mary and his father said, where had you been? And he said, don't you know I'm about my father's business? No, there's a battlefield in this war that we're raging. And that battlefield is on your mind. Because if you can think he is, you will. You'll believe he is. But if you don't think he is, he won't have. Because that's where his power is drawn from. In my endeavors... In my life, this topic has been extremely prevalent in my family, 
And I can think, you know, when I was a young boy, I was around seven years old. My, uh, I got, I remember my parents very distinctly. They, my dad pulled me aside. I was outside and he told me that my grandfather had taken his life. It was like seven years old. My dad lost his father, you know, and when you look at that side of my family, you know, it's not a knock on the Clark name. I hope to grow it. But there's a lot of my forefathers who I have no idea who they are. And it wasn't because they didn't even desire a relationship with me. It's because they passed away at a very young age. I got uncles who, great uncles who passed away on motorcycle accidents. I got uncles who passed away due to cancers from their bad habits. And, you know, I, my own grandfather took his life before I could even fully get to know who he was. But I'll tell you something. When I preached the sermon last time, my dad pulled me aside when I went to go visit him in Florida and he started to remind me of a moment I had when I was a young boy. We went to a breakfast with one of his high school friends and his dad was there and his dad was a great man of God and my dad was excited to spend some time with him and as they're sitting down at the table, they begin to recant some stories about my family on that side and as they were thinking and talking about the stories of that side of my family, my dad had this epiphany as he started to realize these things are evil and as he was thinking of how evil that could have been for his life, he opens up his mouth at the table in front of my family and the people present, and he says, I believe the curse is broken with me. Amen. Now, I need you to see this because I've dealt with this in my life. Y'all don't understand. I used to be the kid at the lunch table who had every joke. I used to be the class clown who never shut up. If you were a good student, you hated me because you were in the class trying to take notes and I thought it was a game. But let me tell you something. I'll tell you there's some classes where I was gripping the side of my chair, not understanding if I would make it through because I was having the worst panic attack, but I was too prideful to tell anybody. Having trouble breathing, hyperventilating. I'm telling you that this same thing that was trying to attack different areas of my family, which I don't even think it's more that it was trying to attack different areas of my family more than it is just something that the devil can use to get a hold of your life. My father at that table made a statement. No, 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 no. The curse on the men in this family, it ended with me. So after I preached my last sermon, one of my dad's friends, the friend that was at that table, reached out to my father and said, I'll tell you what, if my father could have heard him preach, he would have loved it. And I know he would have said, the curse has been broken. Amen. You think today's just a service. You don't understand I'm warned for you right now. No, no, I wasn't back there having high fives the entire time. Oh, I can't wait. I'm just going to go do my due diligence and leave. My heart was in a p posture of thinking of this moment that I would have with you. And I want to let you know that you could change the legacy of your family. You could change the entire history of not only who you are, but if the Lord tarries, those who will come after you. So you might just think this is a Sunday service. But I'm going to let you know that you're going to have an opportunity at the end of this service. And all of hell is going to work to prevent you and seed, sows a seed, um, seed discord into your mind to keep you from a place of accepting it. But I'm going to give you an opportunity here in front of your peers, here in front of the angels and the host in heaven to make that decision and proclamation publicly as I believe is best for an altar like this. That this is going to end with you. This is going to end with your family. And as for you and your household, you're going to serve the Lord, know the Lord, and feel the freedom that the God has for you. Psychologist Robert Leahy points out that the average child today experiences the same level of anxiety as a psychiatric patient in the 1950s. According to the KFF's latest federal data, it shows that 50% of young adults ages 18 to 24 report depressive disorder or anxiety symptoms. Around $280 billion are spent yearly, last time checked in 2020, on mental health disorder. Why is this battle so important to the enemy? Why should he strike half a generation with anxiety, doubt, and worry? What is the importance? Well, first, as we understand we're in a battle, we need to understand that the enemy has objectives. And I need you to write this down. The first objective that the enemy has is this. The enemy wants control of your heart. The enemy wants control 
of your heart. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, guard your heart above all else, for from it determines the course of your life. Your heart and the posture that your heart has and what you believe and what you speak, those things will determine how your life will go. If there's anything that the devil would love to take from you, it's to take your heart and to corrupt it. It's to take your heart and to change the course of your life. Why is that? Well, we see in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, that it says that it is in a person's heart that they believe, which is resulting in righteousness. It is with their mouth that they confessed and they are saved. You need to see this. Your heart is what got you in this building. Your heart is what led you to eternal life. So if the enemy can flip it and he can fill your heart with fear, and he can take your heart and he can say, oh, I know that you believed in God. And he can get you to disbelieve in God. Then he can put condemnation on your life. If he can enter into your heart, he can change your purpose. He can change your destiny. He can change your future. He can take all that God had for you. And all the people that you were supposed to bless can miss the blessing because you failed to deliver where God needed you to deliver. And what will end up happening is ultimately you'll lose the final thing that God wanted you to enter into right now. And that's eternal life. And instead, what you'll receive is eternal damnation. So if the enemy can get your heart, because God's just trying to get your heart. God has been trying to get your heart. Matter of fact, some might say, we've been hearing, you know, this eclipse came. We've been hearing that, um, that the world might end. That the world might end. And all of a sudden, this buzz starts going around, well, the world might end. And then people start to get a little antsy. Well, you know what? It's been a long time, and we've been hearing for a lot of years that Jesus is coming, but he hasn't come yet. I need to let you know something like the word says. God is not slow to his promise. It's not because he forgot that he's not showing up. The Bible says it's for your benefit he's not showing up. Because it exposes the nature and character of God when it says he wills that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. You thought you showed up to church this morning, but maybe God had you come here. You thought it was coincidence. You thought it was an invite, but God was trying to get you to a place where he could knock on the door to your heart, where he could change your family, change your purpose, change your destiny, change your future. If you thought this was just a message for somebody who's got anxiety medicine, no, I'm talking to you, Christian, who's been sitting in your chair for the last 20 years, and you feel like you know Jesus deeply, but you've been paralyzed from what God's called you to do, and you've done absolutely nothing with what he's given you. And I wouldn't call that freedom. I'd call that false hope. And this morning, I want to give you a true hope in Jesus Christ that says today can be the day that we put an end to anxiety, depression, and fear in your life. Amen. So if the devil's after your heart, what way might he try to gain access? I need you to write this down this morning. The entrance to your heart is through your mind. In Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not flesh but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. Where does knowledge retain? It's retained in your mind, in your memory. The knowledge of God. And we are taking, catch this, captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. We are taking captive every thought. Wait a second, there's a war. And in this war, there's a battle. What's the battle for? For your heart. And where does this battle take place? It takes place in your mind. It takes place in your mind. Oh, you thought those thoughts were just happens. Oh, you thought they were just because it's what you watched or just because of what you did. Oh, it might be. But let me tell you, the enemy's been throwing thoughts your way. Throwing thoughts your way. Throwing thoughts your way. See, you thought you were a sinner because you were tempted. No, 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 no. You weren't a sinner because you were tempted. You were a sinner because you ate that tempt up. And you sat there and you contemplated on that tempt. And you acted out that tempt. See, the devil can only move you through your thoughts. He can only make you believe he's powerful through your thoughts. Because you have to believe it. If you don't believe it, it can't be true in his life. No, no, he's only taking the power you give him. And I love this because the word expands upon this. If you notice in Genesis chapter 6, 
we hear this story of God coming and he wipes out and clears out the earth, right? He, the flood comes and only people left are Noah, his family, and the animals he put on the ark. And what's interesting about this is that in verse 5, it says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. No, no, God saw the thoughts of men that were seated into their heart, and that's why he needed to start fresh. And Jesus continues as he sees these modern-day religious men during his time preaching heresy, saying that you should live away, but they can't live it themselves, saying that you should follow these commands, but they can't follow the commands themselves, more obsessed with where their, their seat is on a Sunday morning than what God's called them to do. So fixated on the tradition, they miss that the Son of God is in their midst. Jesus calls them out in Matthew chapter 9, verse 4, and he says, Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you have such evil thoughts in your heart? Jesus makes a connection directly from your mind, from how you think to your heart. God knew that mankind was in a place where they needed a shift, they needed a change, they needed someone to reset the slate because men had been so corrupted in their mind, it had soiled their hearts. Boys, can you come up here real quick? Now listen, when I was in elementary school, one of my favorite units in gym class was dodgeball. And one day I'm playing dodgeball and my whole team gets wiped out. Like I'm the last soldier alive. And I'm like, you know what? This is my moment. I was born for this moment. I've trained all, all my life for this moment. I'm about to put on the craziest comeback one has ever seen. And I start running everywhere. I'm catching every ball I can catch. I'm running. I'm going this way, that way. Boom. It's one-on-one. -on -one. Me and a girl. And I'm like, oh, I got this in the bag. I got this in the bag. Now, we had a rule in our gym class. Here was the rule. Five seconds, then you got to throw the ball. You can't hog all the balls all game. If you didn't know that, add that rule to your list. It's a great rule. So she grabs the dodgeball, and she throws it, and her intention isn't to throw it near me. It's actually not even to get me out. Her intention is to throw the ball far enough that I won't catch it so the timer will reset. And she throws the ball, and I promise you, you have never seen a scrawny white boy run as fast as I was running that day. And I'm running to the back of the gym. And I'm looking like this. Oh, oh, catch the ball. Before my feet hit the ground, I'm ready to celebrate. I'm like, let's go. Turns, boom, right into the door divider. And the next thing that I see is I'm on my back looking at the old gymnasium ceiling. And my gym teacher, God bless her heart, she's running across the building. And she's like, honey, are you okay? And you know me, I get up. Because little kids sometimes, you know, once they know they're hurt, they start crying. But before that, they're really not hurt. So I'm sitting there. I sit up. I'm like, oh, I'm fine. And she's like, oh, honey, you're not okay. You are not okay. And there's just blood gushing down my face. I got messed up. But see, my issue was, was this. Is that I was so focused on what was being thrown at me. That I was looking one way, but my body was going the other way. And what ended up happening to poor old little Cole is I came to a place where I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought I was ready to achieve success. I thought I had grasped what would be the solution to my current problem. But instead, it let me disoriented and confused on the floor. And it kind of looks a little like this. I got my man George here. And the Bible mentions this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. Open your Bible if you got it. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. It talks about extinguishing the fiery arrows from the enemy. It says the enemy's out here shooting arrows. And here's what's interesting about arrows. When they're shooting arrows, yes, they want to kill people, but that's just the first line of defense. What, what if I told you that the arrows were really an advance because the arrows and the bombardment of that arrows allowed the infantry to close in on the people. So it wasn't just about killing the people with the arrows. It was about distracting them long enough so that they could get close enough to be within striking distance. 
And so what happens is this, the enemy starts throwing arrows in your life. And, and here's what's interesting is we would never do this in real life. We would never do this in real life, but we keep trying to catch flaming arrows. We're like, no, I'm gonna get it. No, that flaming arrow was mine. No, that care is mine. And see, just like the Bible says in Peter, the Lord asked us to cast his cares upon him for he cares for us, but you mix it up because now you're trying to catch arrows and you're trying to carry all your cares. And just like George here, it's coming at you from every direction. Can I put some language to you to it for you this morning? You're the single mother who doesn't know how you're gonna feed your family And you've been staying up all night thinking I don't know how I'm gonna do it I don't know where it's gonna come from and watch this. Here's where the enemy comes in. Hey, don't give your tithe on Sunday You need that to eat. Hey, don't go ahead and sow that seed for honor because you know what that money is what you deserve And how will your kids eat tonight? See the enemy starts throwing things and I need you to understand this. There's a difference between concern which could be wisdom and is wisdom and worry. And here's the difference. Worry is when you contemplate on something you cannot change. Concern is when you can do something about a situation or issue. I'm not talking about concern. I'm talking about it's out of your control. It's flying from every direction. And just like the Bible says in the book of Matthew, you start to worry. And I need you to read this here this morning. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 27 through 28. And who of you being worried can add a single hour to your life? And why are you worried about your clothing? Observe how the lilies in the field grow. Catch this. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Here's what happens in your life. Come here, George. What happens is this. The enemy starts throwing arrows, and you keep trying to catch them. He, stops, he starts dropping cares, and you keep trying to carry them, and you just keep spinning and spinning wherever you want me to go. Oh, hey, this way, this way is anxiety. Oh, this way is the answer to your problem. Oh, wait, no, now this way, go back this way. No, family issues, trouble, money issues, addictions, and you're going in a circle and a circle, and then all of a sudden, God says, go. Go, George. You can make it, George. You can do it. But the problem is, because you were trying to catch things you were never meant to catch, and carry things you were never meant to carry. You become disillusioned. You become disgruntled. You get to a place where you no longer can keep equilibrium in your life. And now you're trying to figure out how I'm going to balance everything that was put on my plate. And then God says go and you can't make it. I need to put this in a way you guys can get it. Because I'm trying to wake you all up real quick. It looks like this, pastor. Do you really expect me? after 40 hours a week to bring my family here on a Thursday night so that they can come and hear the word of God. Because you don't understand, there's only one day of my week that I get free, and that's Thursday, and it's my day of rest. And I need you to understand that not all of us have a salary to go work at the church all day, but we can still love God. But then, enter the AAU coach. Enter the basketball coach. Enter the volleyball coach and they come in and go, hey, after your long day at work, I need you to pick your kids up. I need you to bring them to me. I need you to let them spend a few hours with me. I'm probably going to go over. See, y'all crazy when we go 20 minutes over here, but you're not crazy when the coach got your kid for three hours. Then all of a sudden, then all of a sudden, they look at you and they're like, and by the way, this is going to cost you a lot of money with no guarantees. A lot of money, no guarantees. You're going to have to bring your kid to Rochester, bring him to Syracuse. We got tournaments in PA. Come on now, this is the price you pay to be great at sports. And you'll get mad at the church, but you'll just go ahead and believe everything that coach has to say to you. Oh, there he goes again, talking about sports. There he goes again. I'm sure he's going to bring up the campers soon. No, y'all, I'm not trying to offend you unless it changes you. I need y'all to catch that. I'm not trying to offend you unless it might just change you. And this morning, I need to let you know that somehow we start to believe in this disillusion that we can run around for everyone else. We can catch everything we, won't supposed, we weren't supposed to carry, and then we're going to be able to achieve our objective and our mission. And unfortunately, here's what happened. George fell down. And I need you to catch this. The devil wants to paralyze you from your purpose. Wait a second, what? He wants your heart. 
so he can change your future, so he can dictate your life. He's coming at it through your mind. See, you didn't even realize that whole, when we just broke down the whole, oh, wait, the coach and, the, and all of a sudden you're realizing you believe that lie, you didn't even question it twice. And all of a sudden, you're carrying things you weren't meant to carry. You're catching arrows that you weren't meant to catch, you were meant to put out. And before you know it, you forgot what you were even here to do. And then you hear a nice flashy preacher come in and he says, you need to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. And the first thing you start thinking is the analytics on how that's not about to happen because you're too busy. You spend too much time. You got too much on your plate. You got too much load to bear. I just watched someone on Facebook this week. I watched them put like a, like, I'm like, you took a lot of time to write that out. They wrote out like a, like a giant paragraph on how life is mad hard and it's terrible and everyone expects them to be the greatest. And at the bottom of the note, it just said, but God got you, baby girl. See, this morning, I'm trying to wake us up. And I want us to wake up this morning. I love how the apostles said it. Wake up. No, I'm trying to wake us up this morning. I'm trying to get you to see this. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, we're going to talk about purpose now. The Bible says, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. See, the Bible is very clear. You need to be vigilant of this enemy. And you need to be sober minded. Why? Because that's how he's coming. He's coming for your mind. He's coming for your mind. Pastor Cole, you've been talking a lot about your mind. What does that have to do with me? See, your thoughts dictate your heart and your heart dictates your life. And so what I'm telling you is this. I need you to write this down this morning. Now, some of you, you might have it medically. And Pastor told it like these, hey, we're not asking you to get rid of your medication. Go to your doctor. Consult your doctor. We believe the Holy Spirit can move through doctors. They study their whole lives to help you, and I pray they do. But most of you, most of you don't have a disorder. You have disbelief. I need you to write that down. Most of you do not have disorder. A disorder. You have disbelief. What do you mean, Pastor Cole? I show up to church every Sunday. No, no, I didn't say your church attendance had anything to do with your disbelief. Matter of fact, I bet it's really unencouraging to have someone blast you every week with what you should be doing and you're not doing it. Matter of fact, I've been on the other side of that. I've been coming to this church for over 20 years and I have not been saved for over 20 years. But if my parents are watching, I've been saved for 23 years of my life. <laughs> Every time I get done with a sermon, my mom's like, you weren't bad. You were saved. And I'm like, amen, mom, I was saved. I was a good boy. No, but see, the problem is, is that you keep sitting in your chair, taking the offense like you're a punching bag, but nothing ever changes. No, I understand. I'd be upset too. And that's why I'm here this morning to tell you, there's an option before you today. You get to choose what you think. I'm going to say that again. You get to choose what you think. One more time. You get to choose what you think. Did you know that thinking is an action? Did you know it's a decision that you actually make? Did you know that God has given you the ability to control your thoughts? I need you to hear what the word think means by definition. Think by definition is directing one's mind towards someone or something, using one's mind actively to form connected ideas. Thinking is an action. Oh, you're good at thinking. You do it all the time. All of a sudden, you get a little pain in your right elbow, and you become WebMD's number one physician, and you go on Google, and you make that appointment with your doctor, and by the time you get to the doctor's office, you have a list of symptoms, probably aren't even happening, and you're telling the doctor who studied his whole life what you think you really have and how this is the area you think he should be looking, and you start recommending yourself medication. Why? Because you thought about it all day. You Googled it. Then you read the sub thread. Then you read the sub thread. Then you read this thread. Then you asked your Facebook family. Then you asked your immediate family. Matter of fact, no one around you is confused what you're thinking because you can't keep it in your mouth. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
Oh, everyone's not concerned. Wait a second. I'm about to go there. All of a sudden, you start letting everyone know about your financial situation because maybe, just maybe, they'll hear about it, have pity on you, and write you a check. Can I tell you something? That's not faith. Oh, I'm not here to break your heart. I'm here to build your heart. I'm here to build your heart. You do what God tells you to do and how he calls you to do it. But I want to say this. If you would get into agreement in private... If you would hold the hand of your spouse, if you would hold the hand of your team, if you would grab them and do what the Bible says, if two or more agree on any one thing, it shall be done. See, here's the problem. God's trying to build your faith. He's trying to correct the disorder. He's trying to reform your disorder. He's trying to put you back where God believes you should be. But we keep letting thoughts and people in our life who want to say otherwise. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Why? Because you can't be around someone who's full of faith and start telling them your WebMD article. Because they might just look at you and lay hands on you. And then when you keep trying to complain about it, they might be like, receive your healing, brother. And it might just trigger you. Because this time, you're saying, no, you don't understand. I had someone look at me in the eye. No, I, I need you to know, Pastor Cole, that this is actually serious. Oh, it's actually serious. I just want to make sure because I thought when my dad was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and he was told that he would never be healed in his life and he showed up to the doctors and he was cured and they fought with insurance for years because they kept trying to bill him like a man who was dying. But every time they looked, they found a man who was living. I thought that was serious. I thought that was serious. See, the issue is, is you got people in your life that every time you want to believe in something, they got something negative to say about it. No, I'm talking, listen, I, I got some friends that I love. I mentioned it last year. I love Mo Best. I love Buddy Jenkins. I got some people I really love. You want to know why? Because when they look at me and I'm talking with them at lunch and I'm like, no, I see this room full of young people on a Thursday night, like Easter service where there's no chairs. They don't look at me and go, all right, all right. A hundred would be cool, Pastor Cole. Calm down now. There's really not that many people around here. That's a little, but you really think that that's going to happen. Now, listen, I understand that that might be a life goal, but let's take baby steps. No, when I look at people like that in my life, they start putting their arm behind me and they say, you know what? I'm ready to stand right next to you. I'm ready to believe right with you. No, I can see it right now. Hey, I'm blessed. I got a team full of leaders. And when I start shouting crazy stuff to them, they start clapping louder than I've ever heard someone clap because they believe that what I'm saying is from God and they're willing to put their faith on the line for it. Who's in your life? Amen. Who's in your life this morning? You better look at your circle. You better, start you better start taking note and accountability of who's around you. Say those wild things. If you're around me, I'm right there. We're going to go find three Bible verses to confirm what you're saying is true because I'm ready to believe with you. So some of y'all need to just take a position and say, you know what? God spoke to me. But what happens is, is you feel the need to externalize what you're feeling internally because you need someone to validate how you really feel so that you can really keep living however you want. So you can really keep believing whatever you want to believe. And this morning, I need you to understand this. Your faith is what you need with God to guard your heart. That's what you need. Stop looking everywhere else. Stop looking for people to fix your problems because people fail every time. You might love me, but I'm sure one time or another I'll fail you. Just ask this youth student's parents. <laughs> Pastor Cole ended at 845. Fire him. <laughs> it's true though. That's the reality. You know, there's, there's some way I'll let you down. You know, I know why you're, you know so much about your pastor. Some of y'all got, got some things in the back of your head you like to say about pastor. Some of y'all just let them out your lips a little bit. Let me tell you why you think that about pastor. Because your pastor doesn't show up on Sunday through the back door, talk to no one, shake hands with no one, greet no one, look like a superstar on the stage, then disappear when service is over. No, your pastor's at the front of the driveway. Your pastor's loving on you, knows your first and your last, follows you on Facebook. The only way you know his flaws is because he's let you get close enough. Don't be confused. You would be sadly, you would be absolutely terrified to see how some of these preachers act when they're not at the pulpit. I mean, there's some people that you receive from that if you just found out who they were when that door shut, you could never listen to a sermon from them again. 
I'm going to tell you, that's not how it is in this house. That's not how it is in the house. That's not how we operate here. Why? Because we're building a family that's based on faith. We're building a family that's based on faith. We're taking a different position. I need you to understand this. If we continue the verse forward in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, it says this. It says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. See, you've been trying to catch the darts. God's been trying to get you to deflect the darts. But you keep trying to catch the darts. And you keep wondering why life is so difficult. But here's the issue. The enemy's loaded up. And he's not running out. He's got the doubt. He's got the fear. But let's flip the script. Because if you go back and you read all of those verses I read you on this war that we're fighting, every single one of them includes faith. Every single one of them includes faith. Matter of fact, can I read one a little bit further for you? The Bible talks about it in 1 Peter 5, 9. Right after 5, 8, which I read to you, it says, resist him. Firm in your faith. Firm in your faith. Firm in your faith. See, here's what happens a little bit different. Now George has the shield of faith. And it's see-through because you might not be able to see it, but I'm going to tell you what, it's actually there. And what happens is, is now the Lord gives George a directive. George, I want you to go to the people of Amira, and I don't care about your fame. I don't care about your popularity. I care about my people. I need you to get there, and I need you to get there fast, and I need you to keep moving forward. And now the enemy's throwing the darts, but here's the issue. The darts can't get seated in George's life. He's done catching them. He's done grasping them. He's done trying to hold them. He's done trying to carry all the cares. And now as he's on his way in his journey, journey to get to where God's calling them to do. Every single dart that's coming at him is getting put out, is getting fleshed out, is getting pulled out, is getting removed. And George is on his way to do what he said. I need you to know this morning that there's some things the enemy meant to harm you, but God's getting ready to change them for your good. He's getting ready to take this scary thing and he's getting ready to make it a great thing because that very thing that was meant to kill you will be the very thing it hangs itself on. It's a rainy day in Elmira for George. <laughs> and George makes it. <laughs> now, here's the thing. I know you're saying, Pastor Cole, we've heard it. My heart, my mind, my thoughts. Can you please give me something to actually change my life with like what's a practical step I can take from this moment I know I need faith I know I've had disbelief see right because that's what doubt is and fear that's the opposite of faith see because faith causes you to believe what you cannot see and expect that what God said is actually true matter of fact faith is realizing that the world which you do see was created by the things in which you do not and see in one way or another you either have faith or you have doubt Either you're believing what you cannot see, God can show up on your behalf, or you're believing what you cannot see, somehow you'll be able to handle. But one way or another, you're believing something. You're either believing in faith or you have disbelief. But I want to leave you with something today to change your life before we have that moment that I want to make publicly before the people. And that's this. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says this. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you be, may be careful to do all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Your heart dictates your future. It dictates who you are. You want a successful life? You just got it. You want a prosperous life? You just got it. Stop chasing the money. Stop chasing the girls. Stop chasing the popularity. Stop trying to prove all your friends wrong. Stop trying to go to the gym so more people like you. Stop trying to adopt things you never even meant to believe, but you've been catching on to them because you found it makes you more acceptable. No, here's what you need to do. You want a successful life? Build your life on the word and meditate on it. What's the name? What does the word meditate mean? The word meditate in the Hebrew means Hagah. What does Hagah mean? To murmur or to groan. The Bible's not asking you to just think about it. It's asking you to speak it. Why is that? Romans chapter 10, verse 17. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You cannot have faith if you do not hear. You would not have believed if there wasn't a preacher who preached the word of faith to you. It happened whether it was your parents, whether it was an evangelist, whether it was a prophet, whether it was pastor, doesn't matter. You had to hear the word of faith to believe it. 
And so in order for you to get the word through your mind and into your heart, you must consume it like you do other things. See, because I love fishing. Does anyone in here love fishing? Can I get an amen? amen? And you know, I love a few other things. I love dirt bikes. I love riding dirt bikes. It is like one of my top passions in life. I love dirt bikes. See, here's the thing about me. I could tell you everything you need to know about that make, that brand, that model year. I can tell you what one's better, what one's worse. I can tell you who the manufacturer is. I can tell you their history. I can tell you who's won championships on that motorcycle. See, the problem with me is I can get a little bit obsessive when I like things. And see, that's the thing. I might find myself 30 minutes in to an internal dialogue with myself about what fishing gear I'm about to purchase in 2024 for the season. And then, oh my goodness, I know my friend's about to laugh. And then you don't care, but I care. So I'm going to tell you, even though you don't care, I'm not talking for you. I'm talking for me. My wife just nods, but I know, she, I know she's waiting for me to end so she can have a serious conversation with me. And I'm just sitting there telling her what color bait I'm about to use in the Shemung River. See, you know how to daydream too. What if you took all that time you spent caring about what happened with your friend last week and that drama that you inserted yourself into? What if you spent that time that you were on your phone? Oh, you don't want to pull up your screen time. You don't want to do that. You don't want to look at how long you've been scrolling Facebook. Matter of fact, you've been in everyone's comment section. And here's the problem. That's what you're feeding your mind. So what do you think the output is going to be? See, it's not rocket science. It just takes a little bit of a brain and a lot of bit of a heart to understand what God is trying to say to you this morning. You need to replace what you were doing with the word of faith. And to do that, you need to speak it and you need to think it. What if you spent your time thinking about Psalm chapter 103 verses 1 through 3? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities and heal all your diseases. You know what I bet you would do? I bet you would spend less time beating yourself up thinking that you're not good enough, and you'd spend more time realizing that God set you free 2,000 years ago, and all you got to do is accept that he forgave you. I bet every time that little tickle in the back of your throat came, you would make a decision that guess what? If the doctors can't heal it, I still don't care because my Bible says in Psalm chapter 103, verse three, that he'll forget or he'll heal all my diseases. See, what if you thought about those things? Those things? I'll tell you what would happen. The word would go from your mind to your heart, from your heart to your mouth, from your heart to to your life, from your heart to your destiny, from your heart to your eternity, to your heart to your freedom. Philippians chapter four, verse eight says this. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think on these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. What have you been thinking about? What have you been thinking about? Addiction's a scary thing, but you know what I find with people who have addictions? They spend more time thinking about the addiction than thinking about what Jesus can do about it. Most of my life, listen, this is the beautiful part of pastoring when you get to preach. The real part of pastoring is when you're three hours deep in a conversation at midnight and you're sitting there talking to someone and they know what is right, but they still don't have the courage or strength to actually do anything about it. And you're pouring your heart out in the word of God, trying to convince them. You don't need to be in that gang. You don't need to keep living like it's okay to be lukewarm. You don't need to keep living a life that says it's okay to party, drink, or smoke. You don't need to keep living a life that says it's okay to just be a church attendee. You can actually believe God at his word and see him do it. I'm telling you. What are you thinking on? Psalm chapter 119 verse 11 says, I've hidden your word inside my heart that I may not sin against you. Pastor Cole, I got a sin problem. Well, I'll tell you, you got a faith problem. Oh, you got a I don't read my word problem. 
Oh, you need to be here Thursday night despite what you think and despite what those coaches tell you and that how to read your Bible class with Pastor Carla and Pastor Cody. Why? Because you need the word in you. You need to stop listening to those raunchy, dirty podcasts and you need to replace them with the word of God in your car 24-7. You need to stop listening to that foul music that exemplifies living for the devil, drinking, smoking, because that's what everyone does. And you need to change it and find yourself a good worship playlist that will glorify God. You need to replace all that time you spend on social media scrolling. Get your brain right. Open up your Bible to Genesis chapter 1 and start reading that word every day like your life depended on it because it does. Amen. I want to be real with y'all this morning. And I know that this might be something that you didn't see coming. But I'm going to tell you this. The Bible makes it pretty clear when it talks about worry, stress, anxiety. It only comes from one place and from one person, and that's the devil, and it's through doubt, and it's seeded through your mind. Why is that important to me? Well, it's important to you because of this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Do not be anxious in anything, but in everything by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving that your request be known unto God. Did you know that it wasn't God's suggestion that you live free of anxiety? Did you know that it wasn't his hope alone that you would live free of worry and stress, things that are out of your control. See, here's the thing. When you have coal and you get pressure, you make a diamond. Pressure's not the problem. I'm gonna say this for all my young men in the building. If you don't got money, you better start putting applications into McDonald's because pressure's not the problem. Learn how to work somewhere before you try to be a multimillionaire. Husbands, Learn that you might be called to be a preacher and you might be called to do great things, but until you can provide for your wife, please don't touch a pulpit. Why are you saying that? Because God isn't making a suggestion on this life we should live, nor is he in yours. He's asking you to do what's in alignment with his will and his word. And what is that? Live a life free of worry and live a life full of faith. And here's the sad part. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. He proves to be one. Or for the one who comes to God must believe that he exists. And that he proves to be the one who rewards those who seek him. What if the reason you're struggling with sin is because you haven't recognized that your anxiety is? The world has tried to pacify this life you live with depression and anxiety. Oh, and I know it's very real, but I'd like to tell you this morning that it isn't God's will for your life. And as much as I'll tell you alcoholism isn't, and as much as I'll tell you is that drug addiction isn't, and as much as I'll tell you that gossip isn't, I'll also tell you your worry isn't. And a lot of you would love to point your fingers at the person in the room who you see partying on the week, but you'd never point the finger at yourself who's the biggest worry ward in the room. And I want to have you graced with a beautiful opportunity to repent. I don't want that word to scare you, but it is true. The word repent means to change one's mind. Your mind needs to be changed this morning. I believe the statistic is 28% of pastors say that they deal with mental health disorder in America. Could you imagine that almost a third of this country has pastors on the pulpit who don't even feel sane in their own mind? And yet they expect their people to live a life free of it. I got good news for you this morning. It's not me who frees you. It's God who will free you. Amen. But you need to give them the opportunity here this morning. I want to end with this before I give this call. A Pharisee came trying to catch Jesus in his words and he said something to him. He said, what's the most important thing that we should do? Can you list me what are the most important commandments, God? And Jesus, the first thing he lists is the Shema, which is something that we can see all throughout the Old Testament. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Some of you have loved God with your serving. Some of you have loved God with your talents. Some of you have loved God with your money, but you never love God with your mind. 
Because every time something came, instead of standing on the word had for your life, you folded and it paralyzed you from what God had for your life. And today I need to give you this opportunity. There's some of you in this room, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. When I talked about Romans chapter 9 or Romans chapter 10 verse 10, you said, oh my goodness, I have a big issue because I've never had that moment. I've never stopped and believed that Jesus came from God as the son of man to die for my sins and that he was resurrected. Well, I got news for you. 2,000 years ago, there was a man named Jesus, more historically real than the Julius Caesar you read about in your book. If I had time to explain it, I'd get into it. But I need you to know this. He was real, whether you choose to believe he was God or not. But what I can tell you this, the gospel is true. He lived a life you couldn't live. He died a death you should have died. He rose on the third day. He had the apostles and over 500 witnesses see him in his resurrected body. And he ascended into heaven and is currently seated at the right hand of the Father. And right now, now, heaven has a crowd and is looking at you and God is asking you would today be the day that you would give me your heart no you feel the rent you feel the gut-wrenching feeling in your belly right now is he talking about me if you're thinking is he talking about me it's exactly who I'm talking to and I need to give you this opportunity before we do our final altar call today and I know that usually you might stand up, but today I want to keep people seated, and here's why. Because the Bible says if you publicly confess him before these people, you'll publicly be confessed before the Father and angels in heaven. And I know that it's bold, but I need you to hear me. If you can't do it in a room full of people that love you, I promise you, you can't do it in a world full of people that hate you. So I'm going to ask you to do something bold. Listen, it, it's funny because sometimes it'd be the smallest girl. It'd be the most unexpected, braver. Like you wouldn't expect brave to come from. And then all of a sudden they just walk to the front. And then 10 minutes later, some dude who's been looked like he could kill five people with his right hand. And he comes up half an hour later. And it was the bravery of that young girl that changed his heart. So I'm going to ask you to do something bold, but I want you to pray with me. If today you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to count down from three, and I promise you I won't beg you. Because if God can't do it in your heart, I certainly won't be able to. When I count down from three, I want you to meet me right here at this altar, because I want to pray a prayer with you that will be the best decision you've ever made in your life. Get ready. Three, two, one. If that's you, I want you to meet me right here at this altar. Right here at this altar. Right here at this altar. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come meet me right here at this altar. Amen. 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 Now listen. You had your moment with everyone, but now I want you to just have a moment with yourself, okay? Now I want you to just have a moment with yourself. Everyone sees you. You did the public walk, but I need you to hear this. Heaven isn't rejoicing for the people in their seats. They love them. God loves them. But the Bible says that heaven turns up. Heaven goes crazy for just one sinner coming to, re to, to repentance. So if God will do it for one, I bet heaven's having a celebration like we could never imagine right now. Thank you, Jesus. If you're up here, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. You just bow your head and close your eyes. Don't worry about the world around you. Don't worry about anything but Jesus right now. The Bible says where two or more are gathered, he is in the midst of them. Jesus is here and he's ready to come in. But now we're going to make that confession that leads to salvation. So I want you to repeat this after me. Church family, if you'd like, you can join in along and you can stretch your hands towards him. Father, I know that you sent your son to die for my sins and father I know that you raised him from the dead and Lord I've lived a life that fell short of the glory that you had for me but today Jesus I'm ready to give you the glory that's due your name forgive me father and I know as true as your word is that from this moment I'm forgiven Holy Spirit give me the strength to never fold when temptation comes but to follow Jesus all the days of my life if you believe that can I hear the loudest amen that you've ever given in this room 
If you just gave your life, you can go ahead to Mo and T. They want to give you some information. Don't miss out. Go right to Mo and T. Thank you, Jesus. I have one final call. I have one final call. I can't miss this, I can't miss this church family. One final call. I want you to take a quick second. Close your eyes for me. Have a moment with yourself. I don't care what title you hold. I don't care what title you used to hold. I don't care what your business looks like. I don't care what your personal life looks like. I don't care how badly you want to impress the Christians here in the room. You need a moment with yourself. Because there comes a day when you see the judge and he'll be just and it will be just you and him. No one to impress, no one to prove wrong. Just your actions. What have you been thinking about? And this morning, if your thoughts are not his thoughts, and because of it, your ways are not his ways. Church, I need to tell you something. Stop living in the lie. It's time to make today that day my dad had at that breakfast that says, baby, the curse ends with me today. The curse ends with my family today. The curse can't have my children. The church can't, the curse can't have my grandchildren. If the Lord tarries, the church won't have me because for me and my house, we're serving them. If this morning you know you need to align your thoughts with God's thoughts, you need to align your ways and the way of your mind. You need to turn from where you were going, repent and change of how you were thinking. I even feel a call this morning. Some of you have neglected communion with him. Can I tell you something? There's two things you need in this life to receive life. If you don't consume the word and you don't consume prayer, then you can't have the life. Because John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And all things were made through Him, and everything that was made was not made without Him. And in verse 14, it says this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. If you serve the Jesus I serve, if we're talking about the same God, not the one you created, then some of you have neglected that private moment with Him every week. But today it can end. Today the Word can be seated in your heart. So don't care what your neighbor has to think about you. Don't care what the serve team might think about you. If anyone dare point their finger at you, the Bible says, do not judge, least, least you be judged. Because anyone who's for God is for you, no matter what the condition of your life is. This morning, if you need to be set free from things you can't control that you keep contemplating on, if you need to change the way you think and you need to change the way you live and the way of communion and faith with Jesus Christ, I'm going to count down from three and I want you to get to this altar like your life dependent on it because it very well might because some of you in your heart are getting ready to leave this building and without a changed life. Do not miss this opportunity. I'm, it's going to go fast. It's going to go fast and we're only doing it once. If that's you, you better get to this altar. Three, two, one. Meet me right up here at this altar right now. Come to the altar. Come to the altar. There's some of you, you're holding on to your seat. Let go of your seat. Come meet us at the front because there's freedom for your family. There's freedom for your lineage. There's freedom for your household if you would just come to the front and make this declaration. Believe that God will do it. Ushers, can, can you come up here to help real quick? Prayer team, can you come up? We're going to grab a, a person from the prayer team or a pastoral member is going to go ahead and pray with you this morning. But I need to let you know that it's not just the words they say, it's what you believe. Today you come into agreement with what God has for your life. That's where the freedom is. That's where your breakthrough is. So I don't care if they give you a 15-minute word. I don't care if they lay hands on your head and walk away. The breakthrough is when you walked up to the front, and the freedom will come, and that moment of agreeance with another. Go ahead and bow your head. The pastoral team is going to go through. For everyone else in the building, there's a message that God asked us to carry. Don't allow your thoughts or your life to confuse you from what God wants. Mark chapter 16, 15 through 18. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And anybody who would believe and be baptized shall be saved. But those who don't will be condemned. And in my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. And if any deadly thing tries to harm them, it shall not prevail. Today, I want to charge you. Do not come alone on a Thursday night. 
for family night. And do not come alone next Sunday. You better fill your row. You better fill your seats. Because in this house, we have his hunger. And we're never coming alone. Amen. Father, bless them. Give them an amazing week. Jesus, let them live their life through the word. And think your thoughts. And live your ways. In Jesus' name, everyone said, I love y'all. God bless you. We can't wait to see you. We got an exciting month for the live stream family. I'd like to let you know. If today you want to make that decision along with your peers here at the altar, I would love to give you that opportunity. You can go ahead and text the number that you see on the screen and you can text the prompt that you see right there and it will take you to a place where you can fill out your information and walk you through this process of salvation. We don't want to miss your salvation. We don't want to miss your face. And I love that you're tuning in live with us. If there's any way you could be with us, we'd love to see you next Sunday, 9 and 11 a.m. God bless you and have a great week.